Um, okay, great. So we are now moving out of the solar system um, and we are gonna have um, Eleonora Trujillo here from the University of Maryland and NASA uh, Space Flight sent Goddard to talk about um, GRBs and Kilanova and, and all sorts of wonderful things, a lot of which are being done with, with Gemini here. So take it away, Eleonora. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, having me today. Um, so, yeah, so let's start. Uh, as, as you said, I will talk about uh, the search for Kilonove, which uh, has been done uh, with a lot of instruments, including Gemini. Uh, to start, I just wanted to show why do we care about Kilonove. Uh, uh, so these Kilonove are a, a, a new type of transients that really became popular in the last few years. Uh, they are relatively luminous, visible mostly in the optical and infrared, and they're quite short-lived. So they really rise to the peak luminosity in a few days, and then they fade away really uh, quickly. And the reason we, we care about them is because we think they are the signature for the production of heavy elements. So we, we want to study Kilonova to really understand what's the uh, cosmic source of, uh, of our process elements. But uh, there are also the reasons. We want to study Kilonova together with gravitational waves to improve the constraints on cosmology and the expansion of the universe. Uh, and we want to study Kilonova because they are connected with the uh, collision of neutron stars. And so they, they really help us to probe the uh, you know, equation of state of dense matter in, in really uh, cataclysmic and extreme conditions. So there are a lot of uh, um, interesting astrophysical aspects related to Kilonova. Uh, there are also several ways to find Kilonova. I will start to, uh, you know, with channel number one, which is also the, the channel that allowed us to discover the first uh, uh, Kilonova in 2017. That is the uh, follow-up observations of gravitational wave sources. And as you see here, that is quite challenging because gravitational wave sources really uh, span a large area of the sky. So it's, it's a really challenging search. Uh, we were very lucky in 2017 uh, because we, we found a, a luminous uh, uh, kilonova event uh, at only 40 megaparsec. What you see here in this plot are the light curves of this kilonova in different colors. And you see that it starts bright in the optical, but then it really fades away rapidly. And then the, the spectral peak moves toward the infrared band and it stays there for a few days. And then again, it fades away in, in a matter of weeks. And so what we think happens when, when these two neutron star collides is that there are a lot of outflows um, uh, being ejected by this uh, uh, violent collision. Uh, so you see here, uh, one of them, this orange one, is, is a beam of relativistic ejecta, and we think this beam produces gamma ray burst. But there are also these outflows here in blue and red. And we think the kilonova is actually related to uh, these outflows of neutron-rich material which are moving uh, uh, at a very fast uh, speed, something like 30% the speed of light. And so what we see as kilonova is actually the emission from this, uh, the mix of these different outflows. Uh, so to start, I mean, this is like the uh, groundbreaking result obtained in 2017, as you are probably aware, we were not very lucky. Um, in, uh, uh, in the past year with the results of the three. I mean, there were a lot of excellent results, but not a joint uh, electromagnetic gravitational wave detection. I just uh, uh, wanted to discuss that despite the lack of, of a joint detection, we still were able to extract some interesting results from the uh, search of Kilonove uh, from gravitational wave sources. And what I'm showing here is uh, uh, the latest uh, announcement from LIGO of a neutron star black hole merger. 
uh, this is uh, really amazing because we, we thought that these neutron star black hole system, they had to be there, but they ne we never had the evidence for their existence. And so what you see in this map is the localization of the event. You see, this is a, a, a very broad localization spanning 600 uh, square degrees in the sky. And what is even worse, it, it's uh, you know, split between the northern sky here and the southern sky here. So what we do when, when we search for Kilonove, we use this uh, wide field of view telescope and we try to cover the entire area uh, of the gravitational wave uh, localization. This is an example of what we did with the DOTI telescope. Uh, what you see here is a summary of uh, many facilities that were involved in, uh, in the observations of this uh, um, uh, you know, remarkable event. And uh, you know, what, what you can see immediately is that, unfortunately, we need to trade uh, uh, field of view with sensitivity. So the instruments that usually manage to observe a large area of the sky do not have the sufficient sensitivity to probe the range of kilonova luminosities. And the one with sufficient sensitivity to uh, probe the kilonova range uh, you know, still do, do, did not cover a large area of the sky, something like between 20 and 25% in this case. Um, another example, uh, again coming from O3, is uh, uh, this event known as GW190814. Uh, the reason I, I wanted to highlight it is uh, number one is because uh, in this case, the localization was much smaller. So as you can see with a few tiles, we were able to cover the entire area. So in this case, there was full coverage. Uh, what you see in the zoom in, uh, these are the locations of all the possible candidates uh, found for this event. And the reason this event is also so peculiar is because we don't know exactly what it caused it. It could have been a neutron star black hole merger with, uh, you know, being uh, the neutron star, the more massive, most massive neutron star ever detected. It could, it could also be a very peculiar form of light black hole. Uh, so electromagnetic observations did not find a counterpart. Uh, what I show here is, uh, uh, you know, the result of the follow-up from the entire community. Uh, so once we find all these little dots, these are our candidates, uh, we really need to identify, not only to detect them, we need to classify them. And to do that, you know, the uh, contribution of large telescope is fundamental, uh, uh, especially for spectroscopy. And you see here in this uh, pie chart, uh, I report the status, and you see that one third of all the uh, possible candidates was uh, excluded and ruled out because of uh, uh, spectroscopy. So it was either classified as a supernova or the distance scale was not consistent with the um, uh, distance scales of the gravitational wave event. And the other were uh, ruled out because of uh, they were present in archival images and other were ruled out based on the photometric and color evolution. And there is uh, only one uh, fourth of the event that remained unclassified. Uh, one thing that I wanted to point out is that this 25% uh, is mostly composed by candidates that were announced with several days of delays. Uh, so it, it was remarkable how uh, most of the candidates announced within a few days after the gravitational wave follow-up uh, were somehow classified. Uh, by the community. And so this really shows how, uh, you know, the rapid identification of uh, transient and their rapid follow-up observation is critical in this field uh, to, uh, to really achieve the, the main result, which is the identification of the gravitational wave counterpart. Uh, oh, okay, so here, just to say, we did not find the counterpart, but we still placed the uh, 
uh, meaningful constraints. So what you see here in this plot is the range of models that we can rule out. You see there is a wide range that unfortunately uh, is not constrained by the observation, but we can say that uh, uh, Kilonova as bright as the one detected in 2017 uh, is mostly disfavored. You see is in this dark area where you know, it's, it's unlikely that it was there uh, without being detected by this uh, um, very uh, intense follow-up. And uh, just to summarize the results on, on a tree, uh, you know, these are all the limits uh, we collected for uh, the um, gravitational wave detection. Uh, they are compared with the expected peak magnitude of uh, different kilonova models. And uh, we can uh, uh, immediately see from this plot that the more sensitive the gravitational wave uh, detectors become, the more distant these sources are going to be. So we are going to be dominated by binary black holes from, from which we, we really do not expect a kilonova. Um, there are here in No3, we had a few cases uh, at a distance between, I would say, 150 and 350 megaparsec. And these are the events with a, a probable neutron star component, and these are the events from which we expect a kilonova. And what we um, learn is that you know, these distance scales, most uh, uh, wide field imager would not be able to probe the full range of kilonova luminosities. Uh, that is something that uh, you know we we it, it could be done with uh, the Vera Rubin observatories in the future, but with current instrumentation we can still probe the uh, you know most uh, uh, luminous uh, scenarios like the one from uh, for example a magnetar driven uh, kilonova emission, or for example, if we have a neutron star with a black hole that is highly spinning, we also expect a luminous uh, uh, kilonova component. And so this is within reach of, of current facilities and hopefully can be um, probed in, in future LIGO runs. And now I would like to switch to the other channel of kilonova search, and these are short duration gamma reverse. Uh, for people that are not familiar with them, these are like sudden flashes of gamma ray radiation. And we find them everywhere in the universe. They, you know, their distribution in the sky is isotropic. Uh, we cannot predict when they will uh, um, uh, happen. And that's why we have this uh, 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 swift mission that really scan the sky and alert us uh, whenever a uh, short gamma ray burst is localized. And so why do we care about short gamma ray burst? Um, it, the reason is, first of all, you know, they're uh, much better localized than gravitational waves. So the, the job is much easier. And we can use uh, 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 large telescopes like Gemini, which have a narrow field of view, but a much greater sensitivity. And so this really allow us to explore uh, the um, neutron star mergers uh, and their kilonova up to higher distances. And so hopefully we, we are going to detect more. Also, as you see here, uh, you know, with uh, um, uh, what happens is that the neutron star mergers are really uh, asymmetric systems. And so when we use the short duration gamma reverse, we preferentially probe this direction that is uh, uh, along the rotational axis. And so we preferentially probe, a, a, you say, a direction that is not probed through gravitational waves. So here's an example of how a kilonova looks like in, in a, a short year beast. Uh, we see there is this component that we see both in the infrared and at X-ray wavelengths. This is the non-thermal emission coming from the relativistic material and uh, uh, not connected with the kilonova. The kilonova actually appears as a uh, bump uh, after a few days uh, since the gamma ray burst. And so uh, you understand the main uh, 
uh, challenge here is to really have uh, observations that are uh, sensitive enough uh, to resolve this bump from the underlying non-thermal continuum. And this is where uh, large telescopes uh, in, in uh, uh, tandem with HST and in the future James Webb will be key to detect more of these explosions. I also wanted to highlight one case where we use the Gemini to um, you know, discriminate between models and break the degeneracy. This is a recent uh, short duration gamma ray burst. And in this cartoon, you see we, we detected this uh, infrared uh, emission that is uh, quite bright, much brighter than the kilonova detected in 2017. And that was really intriguing. Uh, one possibility is that this uh, extreme luminosity is uh, powered by a magnetar. Another possibility is that this is a standard kilonova with just, uh, you know, appearing more luminous because we are seeing down the axis of, uh, of the neutron star merger. And so for viewing effect, it, is, it just appears more luminous than it was in 2017. And as you can see here, these two models look very similar in the infrared band, but they differ quite a bit in the optical domain. And so we, we were able to place this uh, uh, upper limit with Gemini, which was quite deep. And this really allowed us to favor one model over the other one. Uh, here is another example that is less cartoonish and more physical. Uh, so you see here, this is the uh, model of a standard uh, radioactive powered kilonova compared in blue with the magnetar powered model. And you see the degeneracy happening in the infrared band and the uh, rapid optical observation from large telescope are really critical to, to test this scenario. Um, so this is a summary of what we have learned so far from uh, short duration gamma ray burst. Uh, we have uh, definitely a few more candidate kilonovae coming from the short duration um, gamma ray burst sample, but it's also true that we've been observing them for over 15 years. Uh, so um, it's, uh, it's definitely challenging to find them uh, because of the large distances of short duration gamma ray burst. You can see here that all our candidates are events that are relatively nearby, definitely below 0.5 in, in redshift. And also you can see that the masses of uh, ejecta that we can probe through short duration gamma ray bursts are quite high. So this is a 0.1 solar masses is uh, at the very limit of what a neutron star, neutron star collision can possibly do. And likely if there is anything fainter, we, we are missing them with the current strategies and instruments. So um, just, uh, uh, to look at the future, uh, what we learn is that, um, you know, using the, the current strategies to find kilonovae, uh, the progress has been, um, you know, uh, both amazing because we, get, uh, we got great results, but also challenging. Uh, for, uh, we learned that not all the kilonovae, not all the neutron star collisions look the same. So we should not assume that every single event is going to look like the one we detected in 2017. Uh, we learned this in O3, uh, where we did not find any counterpart, but we could roll out uh, several events with uh, uh, you know, meaningful constraints. For the future, I mean, we expect uh, a higher number of events with smaller localization. So hopefully we are gonna get more chances to uh, search for kilonovae, but we should also keep in mind that these events will likely be more distant. And so uh, it, it's going to be the help of large telescope to without the candidates and, and classify them is going to be really uh, fundamental uh, because they're not gonna be very bright. Uh, the other channel, that we used so far is uh, uh, discovery of short duration gamma ray burst. 
uh, this uh, channel has been quite slow in progress because uh, just we have a few of these uh, short gamma bursts uh, in the nearby universe. And so hopefully with James Webb, we will be able to probe the existence of kilonova up to a much higher redshift. So we will have just more chances to, to test the kilonova model in, in gamma reverse. And finally, in the next few years, uh, we should be able to add another channel of detection, which is just the serendipitous discovery of kilonova through wide field surveys. So without gravitational waves and without a short duration gamma reverse, we might be able to just find these unusual transients um, by themselves. So these, these observations that we're doing now will be very useful to guide this effort for future surveys. Thank you. Great, thank you, Eleonora. Um, so there are, let me, let me refresh to see if there are any questions. Um, none have shown up yet. Um, so I get to use my, um, my chair do my my chair question for you. Um, there um, is there any particular if you had to pick a wavelength range, is there any wavelength range which is the most the best to have to help distinguish the kilonova, or do you really need a full on um, multi wavelength campaign to decide if it's a kilonova or not? Uh, well. You know, if you do infrared spectroscopy, I think that would be uh, with, with James Webb that could tell you if you have a kilonova, just looking at the spectrum, uh, you could detect the features. Uh, but uh, my uh, experience that they are so rare, like even in the future using wide field service, these uh, are going to be rare events. We're not talking about a hundred per year. We're gonna talk, we're talking about a few per year. And so I would throw everything at them just because we need to extract all the information available. And uh, you know, models have the generacies that really require multi-wavelength observations to, um, to be discriminated. Right, okay. Awesome. Um, okay, good. Well, there aren't a few, any other questions. So I have, I have one more for you. Why, why was it um, that in 03, we weren't successful? Is it just the distance or, I mean, I know we were super lucky with how close 2017 GFO was, um, but we did expect to at least see one. And so was it that we did that none happened, or we didn't detect them, or we didn't follow up quickly enough, or have the coverage we needed. What do you think is the biggest the biggest issue there? A combination, but probably the localization was our biggest enemy. Uh, as as I showed, you know, in in some cases we were able to place constraints, but just for like twenty percent of the total area. So we don't know about the remaining 80%. And in some cases it was even less. So having a smaller localization, I think it would be critical. Wonderful, well, thanks so much. And if anyone has any other questions for Eleonora, please put them in the Whova and that'll stay up so we can um, keep chatting about those.